Okay guys, today we're starting on the native seed starting lab. And so you have already either picked up your seeds um, that I ordered for you, or you are gonna use your own seeds, or in this case, you could follow along with data from the seed that you ordered. I will be starting those on campus. However, if you have your seeds, it's time to get started. And it's time to learn about basic native seed starting. I wanna caution you because there's two aspects here. There's germination, which we're trying to break dormancies. Dormancies are laid down in seeds uh, for a reason. Keep in mind, if all seeds germinated and all the conditions were perfect, which happened frequently, if all the seeds germinated and then there was some failure, some environmental aspect, I'll give you a for instance. If you're in a, a dry climate and there's one uh, rainstorm in the summer, and every single uh, warm season germinating seed sprouts and starts growing, and then there's not another rain for a couple of months, all of those seeds would perish. And so there's a longevity aspect to temperate climate and to uh, wildland species where they'll um, stop themselves from germinating. So many barriers can be laid down. And so we're talking about the actual process of germination. That's when water goes into the seed. And so water has to get in there and that's called imbibing water oxygen has to get in there as well and then the enzymes start to break down the seed coat that happens in a hard seed coat so we'll talk about some specific germination uh, barriers and what we can do to overcome them how they happen naturally and how we can um, how we can implement starting mechanisms to help mimic the things that um, that happen in in wildland species we're not really talking about normal agronomic species. We're not talking about our farm crops. If you go to the store and you buy seeds of corn or pumpkins or beans or tomatoes, those typically will germinate with the correct temperatures and moisture applied. We're talking about wildland species which have developed these uh, abilities to, to grow naturally and to survive for long periods of time. Secondly, I want to share with you some aspects of continuation of growing on. So we'll be talking about soils and pots and containers, um, nutrients, those kind of things that don't have a lot to do with the actual germination. They have to do with the subsequent growing. So let's get started right away. Um, I'm following the native seed starting lab that I gave to you guys uh, this week. So temperature options are the most critical. You have warm season growers and you have cool season growers. The seeds respond to the correct temperatures when they uh, begin to germinate. A warm season crop that only grows seasonally or a warm season plant that only grows seasonally isn't gonna germinate when temperatures are cool. It's gonna germinate when temperatures are warm. So the seed actually knows the temperature to germinate. You can take a tomato seed, and I know we're not gonna talk about agriculture crops. It likes warm temperatures to germinate. If the soil temperature is less than 50 or 60 degrees, that seed just sits there in a state of dormancy until temperatures rise and it starts growing. So the considerations that I put down are our greenhouse temperatures. And so even within our greenhouse, we have the normal temperatures, 68 to 75 degrees as the season moves on. But we have a specific heat map where we can force some warm season germinators to have an extra warm spot on the heat mat. So the greenhouse is pretty tropical, um, kind of similar to our uh, homes. Uh, the temperature you would have in your home if you started this in a sunny window. However, you could potentially find an extra warm spot or an extra warm window that has direct sunlight coming in. You could also put a little piece of plastic like um, a foil or like a plastic baggie around to kind of trap in the heat as well. So if, you're, if your temperature is an option for your seed germinations, um, warm temperatures, try and create that environment if you're, if you're doing this at home. If not, you'll be watching me and I'll implement in the greenhouse. Okay, the reverse is cold stratification. This is a period of time that mimics a winter time. So if a, a seed is growing into a plant, the plant blooms, it gets pollinated, the seed falls. A lot of time that process happens over the warm season. In the norm, norm, normal uh, Northern Hemisphere uh, regime, Plants start to grow, they set seed, that seed falls sometime in the summer, potentially in the fall. The issues there is if a seed drops in the fall, the temperatures can be ideal in the fall, can be feel very spring-like, 
They fall, the temperatures are good, the seed emerges and starts to grow, and then we get an insane cold temperature. So again, temperate climate areas where they have a distinct winter and summer season, it's a, the ability of those plants to avoid germinating at the wrong time of the year. So a plant would drop its seeds, those seeds would stay dormant through the winter, accumulating winter chill through stratification. Stratification is cold and damp. It's not below freezing, and it's not above about 40 degrees, so it's that cool temperature and moist. And so the colder the environment, the longer that stratification period um, has to happen to occur for that plant to break dormancy. And so what happens is, is in a climate like that, it goes through the winter, then spring comes, the temperature is warm, and then the plant will germinate. It can't happen if it doesn't break through stratification. So seeds can stratify in a refrigerator um, in a baggie with a little moist media. We like to use vermiculite because it's sterile. And so we wring it out or put just a few drops of water in there. You want it to be moist, but you don't want it to be floating in water. You can also conversely take a wet paper towel, put your seeds in there, fold the paper towel up, put it in the baggie, put the baggie in the refrigerator. And so the time that it takes. So this lab is limited. We only have a certain amount of time this semester. So I'm thinking set something like three, four weeks at the most. When it's in the refrigerator, it's not coming in and out of stratification like it would naturally. Like, so we're here in Chino Valley, Arizona. Stratification occurs uh, throughout the winter when we get moisture. It stops when things dry out. It starts again when it gets cool. We might have a warm spell or stratification. It's in and out and it's accumulating time as we go. In the refrigerator, it's perfect. And so you will actually see your seeds germinate if you have penstemons or other um, temperate varieties that need stratification. And a lot of the packets of seeds you guys chose say right on there, stratification. A lot of times if you're researching this, it'll say plant the seeds in the fall, let it over winter, it'll germinate in the spring. We can mimic that need, what the actual germination inhibitor is, is stratification. The other thing that uh, can be done chemically is a product called gibberellic acid. Gibberellic acid uh, makes cells expand. If you've had a grape from the grocery store and it's like this big and it's a table grape, that's not naturally how big it is. They've been treated. There, there's a few different treatments, but usually gibberellic acid makes those cells expand. It can also make seeds uh, germinate and think they've gone through the stratification process. So I have some gibberellic acid at the greenhouse that we like to experiment with to see if we can break um, stratification requirements. Um, so you'll be looking at your seeds, evaluating them in the fridge when they start to germinate in the baggie, then you got to get them out and get them planted next to your other, um, the other treatment that you're doing with that same seed. Okay, scarification. So scarification is the hard seed coat. So many seeds have a very hard seed coat. It needs to be mechanically broken or softened. And so I'll give you a for instance, a mesquite tree is a great example and it was one of our plants of the week. A mesquite tree grows along a river drainage. The seeds germinate when it's really warm, but you can put the seed in warm temperatures and give it water and it'll rarely germinate. Very, very low percentage of germination because it's got such a hard seed coat, water can't get in there. And so what happens is naturally monsoon rains occur. These things live along gravel washes and stuff. The water flows down the wash in a flash flood. The, the seed is grinding between the rock and the gravel and it grinds just enough that it's deposited at a time when there's good moisture. The seed coat has been damaged or softened. The radical emerges and grows down into the moist soil and it's conveniently near a little drainage where there's extra accumulation of water that's a way scarification happens naturally. Another way is animals. A lot of these seeds we're gonna be talking about were contained in a fruit or in a pod or something. And so the actual seed to get extracted from there was eventually uh, first distributed by potentially some kind of animal, especially wild um, seeds, native seeds. And so the process of an animal eating that enticing fruit a lot of times is to get the seed out the other end and deposit it in a nice nutrient rich uh, material. And it's like it's got its own manure patch for nutrients, but the seed coat has been softened. So that's how it happens naturally. Think about dispersal in birds. Birds can come to a volcanic island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that just emerged up out of the ocean. There's no seeds, there's nothing. It's in the middle of nowhere. The bird can fly there poop, 
and the seeds gr start growing from some this distant um, island that the bird traveled to. And so dispersal is amazing, but that softens the seed within the animal. Lots of seeds die within the animal, but very hard seed coats pass on through. So that is scarification. You can rub the seed with sandpaper or a small file. Uh, you can just nick the corner of the seed. We have a little um, like a wire cutter where we just cut the corner of the seed. Uh, if you don't damage that too much, if you really take a chunk out of it, those first leaves, they're not leaves, the first material that comes up and sprouts above the ground is called the cotyledons. We've talked about cotyledons. Um, if you cut them too much, those cotyledons will come out damaged. And so that'll be a reduction of energy for the, the growing plant. Uh, if it's a monocot, it'll only have a single cotyledon. Um, so you can, you can damage or wound that seed coat to allow water to start to come in. Um, we can do this um, kind of chemically by mimicking this going through the animal by using sulfuric and phosphoric acid. Sometimes you can just utilize um, boiling hot water. Sulfuric acid, which we use in the greenhouse with eye protection and gloves, um, goes really fast. Phosphoric acid takes some time. And so we'll utilize both solutions and you can utilize boiling hot water at home if you want. Uh, I don't recommend eating it and then trying to collect it at the end. That's the disgusting aspect of this lab. Okay, so utilizing acid and I do recommend, and when students have scarified in the past, they can take their seeds and they can rub them, they can clip them, they can use sandpaper, they could use a file on them, depending how big they are. If you have a little pile of seeds, you could put them on the ground on concrete and just scuff back and forth with your foot over the top until they're generally um, scuffed up a little bit and that will help with imbibing water starting the germination process. Okay, seed depth is actual a germination uh, requirement because it's not about the depth, it's about the depth but it's about the light and the light is referring to the depth. So very tiny seeds want to be near the surface. If you can imagine a tiny, tiny little seed, which a lot of you guys have minuscule seeds, if they ended up an inch or two inches or three inches under the ground and they germinated and reached all the other temperature and moisture requirements and germinated, they only have enough stored energy to make it a certain amount of distance before they're just overcome by they can't reach the surface and they die. And so again, you wouldn't want all the seeds to die because they were buried. I once taught um, a group of young students at a local high school and I had a pound of lettuce seed that I gave to them. It was enough to last multiple years. Lettuce seeds are very, very tiny. They dug a trench, put the seed in there and covered it up and came back and said, we ran out of seed. They only dug like a five foot trench. It was enough seed literally to grow, you know, thousands and thousands of plants. So as you can imagine, nothing germinated. Lettuce seeds need to see sun to germinate. They need to be barely buried, just right on the surface. And so what happened was, is nothing germinated. They moved forward. We planted other things. The next year when we cultivated, that seed got dispersed throughout this garden area and we had lettuce, never ending lettuce. And every time we cultivated, more lettuce seed came to the surface. And so lettuce became the never ending crop. Lots of seeds are that way. They won't germinate unless small seeds see the light. Big seeds need to not have light. That ensures that they're buried at depth, okay? Um, if you were using small seeds, you can plant three to five a pinch in the container. I love to do this too. I like to put them in and give it a swirl with my finger because I'm not gonna go and bury them all at the exact depth. The other thing you can do is put the seeds on the top of the soil and then come over the top with a sprinkling of soil or media uh, to cover that seed so that you know you're burying it lightly. But I like to do the quick swirl because some will end up too deep, some will end up too shallow, but a whole bunch will end up right at the perfect um, setup. So when you're using tiny seeds, that is a technique. Some other germination uh, inhibitors or requirements could be smoke uh, and fire, which seems really weird, but in a Mediterranean type climate where, um, where you have these seasonal rains and then um, intense foliage growth, and, and then you have periods of, of drought where the, everything burns off. It's called like a chaparral, um, and everything grows to a certain height. And they're all very flammable materials. A lot of California has a lot of chaparral. We have some chaparral here in Arizona. A lot of those seeds need to experience smoke 
or fire. And what happens is through that process, it clears the undergrowth and then the seeds can start growing without any competition. Giant sequoia trees in California up in the high mountains, um, the cone itself doesn't open until it's had fire response. And so then the seeds are, are, are allowed to disperse. And when they disperse, they go on to bare mineral soil because everything else uh, undergrowth competition was burned off. So then giant sequoias start, start growing. And so again, reintroducing fire into these uh, areas has allowed for new stands and new seeds to grow. And so they've learned that um, the response, the natural response to fire. Um, moisture, I kind of, we, we know that we have to water things in our environment to get them going, but in a lot of places in the world, um, the moisture regime is just normal. We're used to it raining, snowing, precipitation occurring, but in our area, moisture and temperature are some of the biggest requirements. The pH, the amount of acidity or alkalinity in the soil can affect some seeds to start growing. And then the president, presence of oxygen is important. Those are the big ones. There's a lot of really small um, germination inhibitors. And you can imagine too, a seed might need to experience uh, fire to open the cone. It might need to have um, scarification done on the seed coat after a period of stratification. Sometimes there's also a warm, we think of cold stratification. There's also a warm moist stratification if something needs to germinate when it's cool which seeds are amazing. You can have all these layers of complexity of germination requirements and the seed will never germinate until all of those have been met and then it goes for it because it's an all or nothing. Remember, it'll die if it starts going and vibes water and then it loses um, that moisture content, it'll burn down and die. Okay, so these other aspects are kind of about the further growing of the plant. So container, Large size seeds need a big container because they'll put down a taproot. If I plant an acorn seed and the taproot comes down as big as my finger, if it's in a tiny little pot, it's gonna hit the bottom, it's gonna start to spin, and that's not what you want. We're growing wildland species that can get quite large and live for hundreds of years. If we set them up to fail in a container, then what good are we doing with the actual production of those plants? What's the purpose of it? And so what we like to do is for uh, seedlings that have deep roots, we like to start in small pots. And the whole purpose of starting in pots in the first place is to maximize our area of our footprint with growing. We wanna start small and then we transplant up because not everything is gonna germinate, not everything is gonna grow. And we also don't wanna take one acorn, put it in a giant bucket right in the middle and let it grow there for multiple, multiple years with that space being utilized. So what we do is we use the smallest container that's appropriate. Once it gets to size, we move it up. It's called bumping it up. We move it to the next size. We move it up to the next size. I encourage you to do the same thing. And if you picked up pots for this experiment that I left out for you, you'll notice they're small. You'll want to uh, pop that up when they're rooted. You can divide out plants. You can divide those uh, and then you can plant them up into larger sizes if you find success. Okay, container is important. We have uh, plugs and packs and trays and individual pots. Uh, again, low germination seeds, you don't wanna commit a whole bunch of space to them. So we often plant those pretty dense um, and then move them up. All right, soil. Soil is important. Soil you can find outside. Soil you can create, uh, and we call it media when it's something that we, we create. Uh, some of the components we use a lot are peat moss for holding moisture. We use perlite, which is the white stuff. So the, if you picked up soil from me, you got peat moss, you got perlite. Perlite drains the, the moisture away. Um, neither one of these have nutrients, but they have nutrient holding capacity in the peat moss. Uh, vermiculite is light and airy, allows the sun to come through. So I've used vermiculite on the top of small seeds that need the sea light. It can shine through the vermiculite. Again, it's sterile. And then native soil. And I don't want to diminish the role. These are all native plants, so they need to be able to survive in native soil. But when we have access to a greenhouse and we bring outside soil in, a lot of times we're fearful because of the volume that we're moving, multiple plants in there. We're, we're afraid of the potential for disease. We're afraid of the potential for bringing in insects and pests and weeds in the native soil. And so we take 
Um, all the other components that make the perfect sand, silt, clay, like a loamy soil, we try to mimic that with peat moss, perlite, vermiculite. Depending on uh, where you go or what region of the country you're in, you might use things like rice hulls. You might use things that, like sphagnum peat moss. You might use regular peat moss. Uh, places in the U.S. use peat uh, or pine bark or even sawdust or shredded newspaper. The media itself can be very unique. It can also be regional, um, but we, we tend to use a lot of uh, peat moss and perlite. Coconut core is becoming a, a great replacement for peat moss because coconut core is more sustainable. It's utilized in the food products of uh, harvesting coconuts, but the core is the outside part. It can be shredded and ground and, and used as a media, plus it's lightweight. All right. Um, we oftentimes start with um, sterile soils, peat and perlite, and we add back things like mycorrhizae, which help it's a fungal reaction that helps the roots interact and, and grow better and grow uh, into more space. It's a, like a coating, a webbing around. And so we'll, we'll introduce back into sterile soils all the good things by hoping to eliminate the bad by not using native soil uh, for specific um, germination. All right, nutrients. Um, no nutrition in, in this, these soils, and even our native soils have very poor or low nutrition. Um, newly sprouting seedlings uh, contain energy in their cotyledons, and those will eventually shrivel and die as the plant then starts to mine the soil for nutrients or photosynthesize and uh, create nutrition from the photosynthesis process. So we utilize um, liquid nutrients in our injection systems through the water, very low dosages of nutrients. I also, if you picked up soil from me, I put something called Osmocote, and it gives a low dosage of nutrient release, and it's um, coated in different ways with polymers, so it's released at different times. And so it's called a slow release nutrient, and it's a complete nutrient. I just wanted to hit the middle. Native plants don't need a ton to germinate, but if you're going into sterile soil, they don't have any nutrients. So once they germinate, then you want them to keep growing. I've provided just enough nutrients for them to get going. Uh, there's other things, biostimulants, mycorrhizae help uh, pull in more because of that increased footprint and that relationship, they help pull in more nutrients. And the last thing is you're gonna be doing these different treatments uh, you want to make sure your labeling is good. And so put your name, date, special treatment utilized on each type of seed. I left tags out there for you. I hope you grab those. Um, if not, you can use a popsicle stick. It's a good reason to eat a popsicle. Okay, now that you understand the native seed starting lab through the video, you wanna flip your page over. And once you do your plantings, you'll see these data sheets. And so this is how I envision setting this up. So you have three varieties. So I just put one as an example, Penstem and Palmeri, your second and your third variety. Your treatment utilized and what I would like you guys to do, I left space for three treatments. I'm only gonna have you do two treatments for each kind of seed. And then you're gonna estimate the number of seeds that you planted for each treatment. And so the way I envision this is uh, I give you a six pack and, and you can use any seed starting material you want, but a lot of you picked up a six pack. If the six pack has two sides, each one of those has three, you could just divide that six pack in half with one variety, Pensman, Palmeri in my case, one side, so three cells is gonna use scarification, three cells is gonna use stratification. And in my case, the method for the scarification, I'm gonna use sandpaper. And my method for stratification is I'm gonna put them in the refrigerator. So I'm gonna put them in the refrigerator, watch for germination or go four weeks, and then I'm going to plant them out next to the scarified seeds. Number of seeds planted in each of those treatments. And then you just repeat that for your other seeds. Once you get germination, this is how I envision this. The date, so your planting date, and germination is zero. This is this box, if you think about dividing this in half, it's the germination for your first treatment and the height for your first treatment. Your germination for your second treatment and your height for your second treatment. And then this is each week. 
So this is the first week of October, the second week of October, the third week of October, the fourth week of October. You may not get germination for three, four weeks potentially. And those of you that are stratifying seeds, that may take quite some time. You'll have to pull the baggie out of the refrigerator, look at your seeds visually, and determine if you have any, uh, any germination because of your stratification. The other treatments you might do is depth. Um, you might do temperature, uh, things like that. Okay, I hope that helps you on this data sheet. Any questions, email me.